So yeah, today I'm going to be telling you a little bit about what we've been working on for, I guess, almost the past year. So I joined in January of this year, and we're kind of looking at figuring out what we can do to kind of get a, a hybrid workflow to kind of do natural language processing with quantum computing. Um, so a little bit of context about the projects we've been working on. It's a collaboration between uh, where I work, which is iCheck, the Irish Center for High-End Computing, and Intel. So we're Ireland's National HPC Center, as I said previously. We have an affiliation with NUI Galway um, in Ireland, but we have two offices, one in Dublin, one in Galway, and I'm based out of the Dublin office. So the idea is that we kind of support academics on getting their work scaling on the supercomputer, which is K. And I say the National Supercomputing Center because, you know, we only have one and, you know, that's us. So we have our work cut out for us. Uh, we engage with, you know, uh, academic projects. We work with industry partners and we examine the programmability of novel technologies. And the last two here kind of are where this project kind of fits. So the whole idea of programming things on quantum computers, quantum simulators is a novel area for the idea of doing kind of high performance computing. So. Intel were interested in helping us kind of figure out, well, what can we do in this area? How can they get involved? And this project kind of came out of some discussions around that. So the whole idea is we have a 14-month timeline to get something out the door and make it work. And we're funded, as I said, by the Irish state and Intel to about 150K. So uh, those of you who are going to work with grants know that that's not a lot of money to get a lot done with. But you know, we, we make the best of what we can do. OK. So the goal of the overall project was kind of gain experience programming quantum computers, kind of uh, figuring out how do we develop solutions for them, how do we build kind of some application that's easy to just click and go and then users can make use of. Um, kind of examine the, their programmability, address any kind of shortcomings with some of the frameworks we are investigating. And then this project kind of sits into leveraging QC to kind of do a proof of concept application. So the idea of using NLP, which um, we're kind of basing it a lot on the work done by uh, by Bob and, and collaborators. And the idea then is to kind of, within Ireland, to kind of grow the QC ecosystem to kind of enable academics make use of these tools, to make use of the kind of training we'll be providing, and to kind of grow the quantum EQC, or the quantum uh, computing uh, ecosystem in Ireland. OK, so in terms of a solution, oh, how do I get rid of that? Is it, yeah, there we go. So the idea of kind of developing a quantum NLP solution, well, obviously the first thing you need to do before you do this is design a logo, right? So we came up with this really retro 80s one because obviously we're doing HPC stuff, so this sits in a terminal, and the only thing that terminal is good at is very, very blocky, very, very ugly graphics. So this is kind of where we're stuck at right now, but that's fine. Um, more seriously, though, uh, building a solution is kind of where, where the, the kind of the fun in this was. So the problem itself. We need a proof of concept NLP application for kind of comparing sentences. We want it running on top of Intel's quantum simulator. So this is QHipster for those of you who might be familiar with it, which has been rebranded as Intel QS. Has to be easy to use, easy to build, is fast, i.e. has to be able to run on your desktop fast and has to be able to run on a cluster even faster. It has to be redeployable on a real QC, which means we kind of need to follow some nice models for generating the circuits that will work on anything takes arbitrary corpora as input and has to be done in about a year. And so when you're given a, a guideline like this, obviously the first thing you do is panic, right? Because that's a, a fairly tall order to, to get up and running. Um, but obviously then a better solution is to kind of decide what's feasible and then cut out anything you don't need for your MVP, which is you know, business speak for you know, minimum viable product, i.e. how do we get the fundamental kind of example of doing something on, on a QC that actually works. It doesn't have to work better than a classical solution, but it has to just work right now. So that's kind of where we were targeting. OK, so we base it on the disco formalism. Uh, for those of you who might be familiar with the disco formalism, the idea of using the distributional compositional semantics developed by Bob and, and collaborators. I probably won't discuss that in any detail, because I imagine either a lot of people know about it, or there will be more and more talks on this later. So I'll just give a quick flavor of what we're taking from this and kind of how we're using kind of some kind of basis of this uh, in our work. So the idea is kind of taking sentence meanings uh, determined by their kind of position in, in corpora and then kind of choosing known meanings based on component words. And the idea then is that defining those sentence meanings kind of as, temp as tensor products of these component words. So there's a bunch of references there. I'm sure I have most of them, but obviously there's probably a few more. Um, 
but we'll just move on anyway. So, so feasibility is kind of an important thing here. We have, as I said, a limited timeline, a limited resources, and we have to figure out, okay, what's actually possible to do in the few months that we have. So one, quantum computing data input is problematic, as you all know, okay? Getting a lot of data into a quantum computer and getting a lot of data out of a quantum computer doesn't really work like that. I mean, I kind of tend to speak to, I mean, CS people about this, like programming a GPU. You can put a lot of data in there, it takes forever, you can take a lot of data out of there forever, but once you have a data in there, you can do all your magic, you know, you can kind of churn the numbers. So the idea is figure out what small amount of data can you put in there, crank the handle, get your magic happening, and then get a result out again. So ideally, a QRAM, which would be the, your quantum uh, random access memory, would be perfect for this because you have a kind of a well-known bounded access pattern. Um, but problematically, you know, that would take a long time to, to work on. We don't want to have to build an entire architecture for quantum RAM to make this project work. So we kind of decided that this is unfeasible. So we kind of figured out, well, what kind of alternative representation can we do to prove that this would actually be something we can play with? So since this is a proof of concept, we just figure, why don't we just encode uh, a bunch of bit strings linearly as a superposition state and just work with that. Sounds reasonable enough, okay? Then we say like, well, okay, if you've encoded all this data as bit strings, what do you do for your comparison? How do you do this? Do you use amplitude estimation? Do you use some kind of variant of a swap test or you know, coherent swap tests? Um, well, realistically, those are not gonna fit well to our problem, so you know, we do the, the KISS principle, which is, you know, keep it simple, stupid. We kind of have a humming distance approach where you're just comparing bit strings uh, depending on, on what you've encoded and what you want to test against. Okay, so then you say, well, okay, what happens now? Do you have to prepare and pre-process your data for this to actually be relevant, and how do you make this work? Well, yep, that's true. You do have to do a bit of classical pre-processing, and unfortunately, the bottom of my slide is cut out. Let me just scroll down a bit. Yep, so what we do is we just assume simple sentences. We assume noun, verb, noun sentences only. So the idea is that we are only going to parse and work with sentences that map this, to this structure. More complicated sex, uh, sentences are definitely possible with the framework, but it would obviously involve more work, so we just said, keep it simple, we'll work with something that has kind of some simple meaning, so noun, verb, noun, sentences. And yep, that was kind of enough for us to say, okay, with this kind of model, uh, we're gonna start building. So in terms of the design and workflow, what we decided on was, oh, let me, okay, I'm just gonna scroll down and make sure this fits, there we go. So in terms of the design and workflow, one, has to be a Python interface, right? Because the whole idea of Python being the you know, lingua franca of quantum programming these days. I mean, obviously there's a few other contenders, but most frameworks have a Python binding or some way of interacting with Python. So this kind of became evident that this is the only thing we, we need to have as an input or as a, as a front end interface. Okay, so then we have to deal with tokenizing our data, figuring out what the, the, the word types are. And we made use of the NLTK library for this. So this is the Python kind of natural language toolkit. The idea that we give it a, a body of text, the NLTK toolkit tokenizes our text, tags the words, tells us what they are, and then we can use that to kind of infer what meaning space the words live in. Are they nouns, are they verbs, et cetera. Okay, so then obviously once we know what they're tagged in, we separate them into two data sets, the nouns data set and the verb data set. Right, so we define a basis from this. Now, when I say basis and I say sent, you know, actual tokens, there's a little bit of kind of malleability in there. How do you define words that are orthogonal to another? I mean, within some kind of relative degree of freedom, you kind of say that, well, these two words are kind of opposite. So yes and no would be somewhat orthogonal, but you know, other words like maybe might be somewhere in between. So we have kind of some method for figuring out how words are opposite to one another in terms of orthogonality, how close they are to one another, and I'll get onto that in a little bit. Okay, so then what we do is we take these basis tokens and we choose them as to be the fundamental words in our language. So the idea is we can map other words onto this basis set. So if you have more complex words, you represent them as kind of linear combinations of the fundamental basis words. And this, Somewhat works, yeah. I mean, uh, there's obviously some caveats to be had with this, but it actually does kind of, in the scheme we're, we're developing, makes sense. So I'll discuss this in a little bit more detail later. So in terms of design and workflow then, back end, we need things to be fast. As I said, one of the previous requirements of this was we're working with Intel. Intel wants everything to, 
be compilable and run fast. And since we're using Intel's Quantum Simulator, which is written in C++, we needed a backend written in C++ that has to be built on top of this. So the idea is we're using Intel QS, we're using MPI, and we're using PyBind 11 to do our Python uh, bindings. So in terms of, oh, that's not going forward, there we go. So the idea then is we use the Python interface to do our pre-processing. Python interface generates a bunch of bit strings for us to represent our data. That data is then passed to the C++ layer and it's encoded uh, into the superposition states. And from there then we encode some test pattern into an auxiliary register, so a qubit register, and then we can calculate the distance, uh, the Hamming distance between our auxiliary data and our encoded data set. We use a controlled um, RY rotation to essentially do post selection or you know, quantum digital analog conversion for you who are kind of familiar more with, with that terminology. And we use this to kind of adjust the amplitudes to kind of match uh, closeness of the encoded data set. We then do a measurement and then we repeat and we build up our distribution. Okay, so in terms of a, a workflow, there's a lot of architecture stuff here. I'm aware of this, but that's fine. You know, I think it's good to be familiar with the entire um, application, both methods and, and design. So this is kind of what we came up with and how we kind of do the, the overall design of the problem. So one, we start in the Python layer. We tokenize and tag our corpus. So after we pass in our data set, NLTK comes along, splits up all the words, oops, sorry, maps the, the words to individual data types, and then we separate the data sets. So then we choose our basis tokens from these data sets. And choosing the basis set is, in this instance, you know, simply done by looking at what is the most, you know, 10 most frequently occurring words, what's the 16 most frequently occurring words. And you use those to say we can map other words to these, to these words in some uh, relative way. Okay. From there, we create our noun verb noun sentence bit strings. And from that, we do a preparation to essentially prepare the quantum register to encode these bit strings. So I'll get onto the, the, the mathematics of what actually happens there in a few moments. Once we've encoded them, what we do then is we put in our test pattern. So we have some sample sentence in the noun verb noun framework that we say, okay, how close is this data set to all of the encoded data sets? We calculate the Hamming distance, we perform a measurement, and then the capo we return to the beginning and continue on and to build up our, our distribution. Okay, so in terms of solution architecture, I'm not sure if you can see that very well, but this is kind of where uh, we got support from Intel on this. So Intel gave us the Intel Quantum Simulator, and obviously for our, our problem, we needed to build some kind of uh, work around this. So we ended up with something like this, um, which is you know a few, a few levels kind of uh, higher, where we kind of added a bunch of functionality to ensure that this works. So the colors on here represent the different uh, front end and back end. So on the left, you have the blue, which is the Python. Uh, on the right, you have the, well, it's red here, but it's orange here, the, uh, the C++. And the green are the external libraries we've used to kind of ensure that this is as easy to do as possible without actually reinventing the wheel the entire way along. Okay. So to make it work, some of the extensions we had to build on top of Intel QS. So Intel QS is a distributed state vector simulator. So the idea being that you can play one and two qubit gates, it uses MPI to distribute your state vector over multiple nodes, and it handles kind of a well-optimized routines for doing this behind the, uh, under the hood. There's no modules built on top of that, so we obviously had to add in some additional functionality to ensure this works. So we had some kind of mappings to do some kind of quantum state manipulations. We put in modules for you know, quantum Fourier transform, inverse quantum Fourier transform. Uh, one of the important ones was you know, n-controlled unitary gates. So the idea if you have a 5CX, so let's say you have a five-controlled uh, Pauli X gate, you can map those down and recursively break it down into different uh, two-qubit gates. And the idea is kind of figuring out how do we optimally do this in a way that doesn't explode the, the entire gate set that we're kind of transpiling to. So this was uh, kind of important for the work. So the creation of the arbitrary superposition states, which is what our encoding step does. This was kind of another, another state we, uh, or another module we added in there, as well as some additional ones for like demonstration, like doing a phase oracle and diffusion operators for doing rovers and doing kind of the Hamming distance um, on the sub-registers for the final comparison. Okay, so then in terms of bindings, you know, we had to add in some stuff for visualization using Quantic so we can actually see that the circuits we're generating at the end of this actually look reasonable, make sense. 
um, doing some kind of mappings between NumPy. So obviously, if you wanted to define your own matrix, define your own data sets, it's easy for you to just use NumPy, put it into the Python layer, and all of our stuff handles it as though it's natively encoded in C++. Uh, doing some kind of arbitrary unitary gate de decomposition. So this was kind of giving, uh, given a specific unitary gate and a certain depth of unitary matrix that the simulator supports. I want to figure out what, uh, what, what supported operations in the simulator will give me this unitary matrix. So this is kind of just using Pauli X's or Pauli, Pauli matrices, Hadamard, and then rotation matrices to map to some arbitrary unitary gate. So this kind of comes in useful later on if you're doing some specific states of encoding. And then obviously testing, which is important. And the last thing, everybody needs to be able to use this. So we're using Jupyter as kind of an interface. We have a bunch of demos and kind of an easy way of people getting on board with this because obviously if nobody knows how to use your software, nobody's going to use it. So we had to make sure that was kind of an important thing as well. Uh, so build system, uh, we had to just make sure everything builds nicely. So QMIT, so we use CMake, just click, click Go. It handles all the dependencies. Everything using conda and pip behind the scenes. So Python pulls down any packages it needs to build anything. And then you just load your environment, click Jupyter Go, and then obviously you're ready to run QHipster. You're ready to run our stuff and you know, play to your heart's content. So we kind of have a quick distribution of what's in there, you can't really read it, but Jupyter Notebook is a large component of this because they are very bloated and they grow pretty quickly in size, but that's fine. Uh, the majority of the work is C++ and Python. We have a bunch of demos in there and we'll discuss a little bit about the source code later because one of the more important things right now is actually doing the data encoding and the pre-processing. So this is where the bulk of the work um, was, was kind of trying to figure out. How do we kind of approach encoding the data? How do we approach getting the, the resulting uh, mappings? Out. Okay, so the idea being we have some words in our data set, as I said before, in nouns and verbs, and we want to generate unique bit strings to represent them. We want to use a Hamming distance to compare the bit strings of different sentences, which are in the noun verb noun structure. We want to use some kind of post selection framework to adjust the amplitudes of the encoded data. And then we want to do a measurement on these post-selected states so that we can actually build up our distribution. OK. So obviously, we need to do this with a qubit register because you know, we're doing stuff in a, in a quantum domain. So that's kind of important. And what we've decided for this was to use the framework from Trugenberger. So there's a PRL there for anybody who's happy to, to look up the, the scheme to find. And his idea was to kind of essentially carve off probability chunks from a qubit register and encode your arbitrary bit strings into these probability chunks and to do this iteratively. So it seemed like a very straightforward implementation. So we decided proof of concept, just make sure it works. So we went with this. So the, the kind of bulk of that framework uses control X's, N control X's, and then a controlled unitary matrix defined as S. So he defines it as the, the matrix with the square roots. Um, we decided that it's much easier to just look at this as an RY, so that's you know, your RY where your angle is given by you know, that negative uh, cos inverse um, angle such. Okay, so the bulk then of this work appears by creating our qubit register. So if you assume just for, for simplicity that this uh, bunch of lovely, lovely block spheres here can be treated as a qubit register, the first thing we do is we partition them. So I'm not sure if you can see the lines, they're a little bit faint, but we have a register on the left, a register in the middle, and a register in the right. So the idea is the left register is gonna be our data register. This is what stores our superposition state. The middle register is a control unit, which is used to kind of control the operations that happens in there. So depending on whether it's in a 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 state, different operations happen. So this is kind of can be mapped to Kind of similar operations in a classical computer. You know, you're using a kind of a control unit to cause different operations to happen over your, your data registers. And then the last one is our scratch register. So we use this to kind of temporarily encode our data as we're going to prepare um, the, the state on the, in the data register on the left. Also, we use this for the storage of the test data in the Hamming distance. So this is kind of just a multi-purpose register that we use to, to do some of the calculations. Okay, so in terms of gory details, you know, obviously this is what some people care about, so I put this up here. These are the steps we use to do the encoding. Starting out with your registers, 
what we do is we set, take our initial state, which is you know, all zeros in the left, all zeros in the right, and then zero, one in the middle for the control register. We then do our encoding or pattern into one of the registers. We then do a bunch of steps in between for the encoding. We carve off our state with the control less matrix. We do an uncompute then of all of the steps to put the data in there, and then we repeat. So this is kind of iterative. We go through this cycle to put our data into the leftmost register. And then the final step is, you know, where we kind of repeat this to, let's say, n patterns, we're done, and we're ready to actually use the register on the left to do our comparisons. Okay, so let's kind of go through a quick sample. So very simple sentence, or, you know, sentences, uh, depending on who you want to phrase this. So John rests inside, and Mary walks outside. So that's kind of an example of two noun verb noun sentences, right? So the idea is we want to take this sentence, parse it up, figure out how we encode this, and then represent it using our scheme, and then do our comparison at the end with some kind of data set. So for this to actually work, well, the first thing we need is we need a basis data set, so our fundamental language that we can use to represent this, this sentence in. So we've just chosen this one arbitrarily. We have for the subject noun, which is the leftmost nouns, we have adult, smith, child, and surgeon. And for the verb, we have stand, move, sit, and sleep. And for the object nouns, we have inside and outside. So you can see here we have chosen some binary patterns just to represent these. And what we, you should notice is that the binary patterns themselves are going in terms of incrementing by one Hamming distance uh, each one. So zero, zero to zero, one, only one bit has changed. One, zero to one, one, one bit has changed. One, one to zero, one, one bit has changed. So this ordering becomes important, and I'll discuss this a little bit later in the steps. So, with this basis, basis data set, we need, okay, figure out how we map our sentence onto this. And again, we can just do this manually, like so. We can say, well, okay, maybe John is an adult and a smith. So what we do to represent John is some superposition state of adult and smith. Mary is a child and a surgeon. So we create a superposition state to represent Mary. Similarly for walk, walk should be you know, standing and moving. Obviously, that makes sense. Resting should be sitting and sleeping, some kind of relationship between there and inside and outside are just inside and outside. Okay, so this is kind of a, as simplified as I could make it to, to kind of represent this. And then for the, the type of kind of generation of the bit strings, what we do is we just tensor our, our N, S, our V, and our N, O's. So in this case, John rests outside. Tensoring John with rests and outside, we get John rests inside, sorry. Uh, we get you know, this, uh, this state. Similarly for Mary, Mary walks outside, we get this state. And then if you want to put the two of them together, well, you know, you get this state here. So the kind of, depending on how you choose your basis, how you choose your mapping, your original sentence, a lot of factors to be taken into account with, then we all get to, to this final representation of the sentence in, in this framework using this method. Okay, so then I say, well, what is the relationship between adult stand inside and the encoded pattern there? It's like, okay, right. What we want to do then is we want to generate the bit string for adult stand inside and then just do kind of a Hamming distance approach to compare it to, to what we've encoded in our original data set. So for those of you who maybe don't want to, to look at the numbers, adult stand inside should be zero, 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 zero. Okay, nice and easy. So the idea being that if you want to calculate the Hamming distance between all zeros, you just basically calculate the number of ones you find in the other data set. Okay, so I've kind of skipped a few steps here because obviously it's tedious just to watch me multiplying everything out. But what we've done is essentially taking the tensor product of our adult stand inside with the entire register here. And what we see is the adult stand inside pattern on the left and then the original encoded data set on the right. So you can see that we have the entire thing completely distributed over the encoded pattern. And the idea then is to figure out which one is the closest to this. Well, I mean, it might not take much work because you can see 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, which is the only one that has a bit flipped, is the closest pattern to adult stand inside. And we can then have a look at some kind of distribution of the results there because it's obviously better to look at a distribution than it is to calculate numbers manually. Uh, we can see that adult sit inside is the closest to adult stand inside. So this is done by essentially encoding the data, doing your 
pattern encoding or your test pattern encoding, calculating the Hamming distance, doing your post selection, and then measuring the resulting um, data register. And you can see that after a large number of samples, uh, I think it was something like 10,000 in this case, we see kind of a nice distribution of which ones are closer to you than others, which ones are further than others. In this case, adult sit inside is the closest, and surgeons move outside is the furthest away. Similarly, if I wanted to choose a different pattern like adult sleep outside, you know, we get a diff different distribution from this. You know, obviously this is kind of small potatoes looking at very, very small data sets, but the method should still carry over if we wanted to increase the size of the encoded data. So in this case, you have something like adult sleep inside is closer, and surgeon stand outside is obviously uh, less close. So caveats. Well, obviously I've kind of said we can do this, but I haven't discussed any of the limitations. Well, you might say, well, the biggest limitation is, you know, you have to measure everything every time, and you're essentially losing any of your um, possibility to do things using kind of a quantum representation. And, you know, you're right. You have to do a lot of encoding to do this. You have to do a lot of state preparation. And that is the most expensive step in this. State preparation does take time. However, in the off chance, you know, the, the idea being if you can do your state preparation once and then you know, someday we'll have a, a QRAM which we can say, okay, we have this stored already, we can just prepare our data by pulling it across, um, then obviously we're kind of looking at a, a much, much more bounded pattern. But right now, we lose all our data every time we do a measurement with the re-encode, so obviously that's one of the limitations. Okay, so one of the more important things to discuss now is the ordering of the bases. So the graph on the left, um, I'm not sure if you can see the numbers, if you can't, well, those are the individual binary patterns which we can represent with a two-qubit register. So you have 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, and 1, 0. And the edges that are drawn between these are the Hamming distances between each of those patterns. So the idea being is we have to kind of figure out some way of mapping our sentences onto this, this graph-like structure such that we're kind of preserving the similarity or the difference between words uh, in such a way that the Hamming distance reflects how close those words are or how far they are apart. So it's essential to keep the Hamming distance reflective of this similarity. And if we do have a more complex data set, well, the problem becomes a little bit more difficult. So in the case of this, it was quite easy. You know, we can say child and adults should be, you know, two apart, whereas surgeon and Smith should be two apart. And then obviously between them, they should be one apart because, you know, maybe there's kind of some, some similarity. But Obviously, depending on how you choose your encoding, you'll get different results. Right, so let's go to a bigger data set. So if we need to decide on some way of encoding this data to ensure that the, the, the Hamming distance is valid, subsequent patterns need to be kind of smaller Hamming distances, and patterns that are not close together need to have further distances. So in terms of getting a simple way of, kind of generating bit string patterns, we just take a register of zeros, sh left shift a bunch of ones through it, fill it up, and then push them back outside. So you can see that the Hamming distance between all of these is going to be one at a time. But the nice thing as well is that the next uh, nearest neighbor Hamming distance, or the nearest neighbor Hamming distance is going to be um, is one, the next nearest neighbor is going to be two, the next next nearest neighbor is going to be three, and this kind of structure is preserved across until you get a graph like so. So this is kind of linking all of the different bases um, for encoding, and the edges represent the Hamming distances between each of these individual bases. So elements that are one apart, have a Hamming distance of one, that are two apart, two, et cetera. And what we want to do then is figure out how do we map sentences on this such that these Hamming weights reflect the closeness of the words or the similarity of the words. So in this case, I've mapped a basis that we've used to calculate in Alice in Wonderland. So I'm not sure if you can read that, but we have King, Hatter, Alice, Griffin, Turtle, Mock, Time, and Queen. Okay, so these are the words that were the most common that appeared, so we said, okay, let's run with it, let's just keep them in there. And we want to figure out some relative ordering of these words such that the Hamming weights are reflective of how close these words are together. So if you can see, you probably can't read the captions there, et cetera, but this is kind of a, a histogram of the positions of these words in the text binned in kind of 2,500 um, steps. So every word in the, in the text of Alice in Wonderland is given a numeric index, and then we bin certain indexes together, and we see how many times does this particular word occur in that text. You can see Alice appears quite a lot, 
uh, queen appears quite a lot towards the end, et cetera, et cetera. And the most important thing is then we have this distribution of words, these positions of where they are, and what we do is we calculate the relative distances between these positions. So by calculating these relative distances, we can kind of build up a, uh, information on how close certain words are together to others. And you might say, well, okay, what do you do with, with all of these differences? Well, we can define a graph. So what we do is we take the tokens, we define a graph with those tokens, and then we connect all the tokens with edges defined by their weights. So, or with, um, sorry, with edges uh, defined by their, their relative distances. So then we can just remove any edges that are larger than the minimum value. And so we have a fully connected graph then where there's only one edge connecting each of the tokens defined by their, the minimum distance between those words. And then simply we just find a Hamiltonian cycle in that graph. I say simply because, you know, there's obviously a toolkit that does this for you. I don't want to have to do this manually. So we push this graph in. We ask, find me a path in there which traverses the graph in the minimum um, number of distances and goes back to the start again. And that defines the ordering which we need to jump from one token to the next. So words that are one apart have a Hamming distance of one. We place them in such a way that they're encoded at a Hamming weight of one apart. So yeah, that's kind of how we do the... The, the ordering, sorry, I jumped ahead. So yeah, this is kind of how we figure out how to map these, these tokens onto this graph in a way that gives them some similarity between how close they are or how far they are apart. And then as a result from this, we can encode that into our quantum states. And we can do this kind of in an automatic fashion. We don't have to kind of manually do it as we did previously. Okay, so acquiring our ordering data. So this is a, I think it's Emma I used? Yeah, okay. So this is kind of just looking at the a paragraph in there, figuring out, okay, figure out some words in there. It's hard to see, so I might just invert it. There we go, much better. So you can see we have some verbs in there. Had, we can see we have mother, we have governess. And, you know, by figuring out where these are relative to one another, then we do this calculation. So it's a matter of parsing the text, looking at the basis tokens, figuring out where they are in the text, calculating, taking their positions down, storing them in an array, and then using this for all the, the, the processing going forward. So this is all done in the Python layer. We use NumPy kind of to do this behind the scenes. And then all the pre-processing then feeds into the quantum, uh, to, to the C++ backend layer. So we have this data now of our basis set, and what we want to do is map our tokens to it. So the idea is we have other words in there that are not represented in the basis. I want to say, OK, how do we represent these words? So I'm going to say, I want a composite word, a word that's based in some relative basis that we've chosen. And this was kind of an automatic way of Alice in Wonderland again. We did some different metrics for calculating the, the basis set. So the outer blue orbs are the basis, and the inner green ones are the mapped tokens. So the idea is we figure out relative distances between the tokens and the basis set. And the edges here, again, have the distances between these tokens and the basis, and we can define some arbitrary cutoff, maybe 10 words apart, five words apart, two words apart. And if these tokens appear relative to these basis items uh, a certain number of times, we can say, okay, these are related, therefore this basis can be representative of some linear combination of, uh, or this uh, composite word can be given in this uh, basis as some kind of linear combination. So we can see our hall and table here are kind of maps in, in this graph. And they share some, some similarities. Obviously, not, they're not mapped completely to the same basis set, but this is just kind of a representation of some of the, the additional kind of uh, comparisons we can do between the two data sets. And one of the important things we kind of found was that defining these relationships are kind of important. So if we have two different data sets, which obviously can be the same data set, uh, in this case, we have a known basis and a known basis we can use them to kind of infer the, the binary basis ordering. So this is defining the graph, defining the edges, and then doing the Hamiltonian cycle. We use the basis elements, comparing it to itself to figure out how do we map, do this mapping. For the composite uh, words, the words that are not in the basis, we can map them onto the basis, and then we can do a kind of representative meaning of those words in that basis. Composite and composite, well, we can do internoun relationships. So we can look at how related one term is to another. So the previous slide, for example, was an example of that, where you had table and hall, and we're looking at how much of an overlap there is between the, the, those two data sets. Similarly, for verbs, we can do the exact same thing. And then if we're actually looking at the, uh, the, the, the different data sets, so the, the noun basis and the verb basis, well, if we're comparing the two of these, we're actually generating the compiled bit strings, which is representative of one kind of uh, functional kind of basis elements for representing it in our quantum state. 
And then doing a kind of a higher level approach, we have the noun composite and the verb composite. And then this gives us our kind of compositional meaning for the bit string generation. So by kind of comparing these together, we have a large number of kind of linear superpositions of the basis elements. OK. So that's pretty much what I have on this so far. What's next is kind of the important thing is, so we have to do some finishing touches on this work. As I said, we have a 14-month project. So we have until February to kind of do the last work statement that was written down. And that involves running things at scale. So kind of more of the, the complicated, the complex and automated processes I mentioned at the end, this is our last two months of the project. This is kind of what we're, we're deciding on, or, or we're expected to do. So we're going to run all this at scale on our supercomputer. So the idea being that we can ramp up the, the number of qubits available to us and then ramp up the number of data elements we can represent, and then we can do bigger calculations. We want to test the methods on different books. You know, Alice in Wonderland is great and all, but it's a fairly complex text if you're trying to teach a quantum computer to read it. Uh, so we're kind of going for figuring something a little bit simpler and maybe something a little bit more complex again to kind of see where we get. So we have a, a kind of in discussions with a, an NLP startup, Tilda. Um, those of you who are familiar with them. So we're kind of looking at taking this to be a much more long-term project, kind of exploring use cases, figuring out if there's something we can kind of do in this domain, if there's some way of kind of extending this work and in a different manner to kind of do some, something that will kind of use, suit their, their business case. And additionally, one of the things we're doing is actually feeding back into the development of Intel QS. So since we're using it kind of as a, a kind of a, a library to kind of build upon, we want to be able to tell them what works for us, what doesn't work for us, and what they need to kind of address. OK, so in summary, as I said, one of the things we were doing was designing and building a proof of concept application uh, for NLP. Uh, we were kind of looking at the feasibility of kind of quantum computing or quantum simulators for looking at new applications. And obviously, as I said, there's many more quantum inspired approaches to encoding and analyzing data that can be explored in this space. And I've covered very little, I guess, of the entire domain that could be done. So before I finish, I'd like to just thank my, my colleagues at iCheck. So Venkatesh Kanan, who is the technical manager of iCheck and was the PI of this project. So Miles Dial, who is my coworker, um, getting all the C++ stuff implemented. And Peter Woods, who is managing the, the project. Uh, so Intel, uh, so we've had good support from Intel from Jim Keneally and Fabio Barufa, who kind of helped us with getting things up and running. Um, I should do a quick plug because, you know, we are hosting the EQTC conference in November of next year. Feel free to apply. Um, this should be a good conference. It was in Grenoble of this year, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah, with that, I would say if there's any questions, I'm going to put this guy up here because obviously this is our little mascot, and I forgot to put him out in the start. And I think we got a nice guitar, so I'm going to give him a guitar as well. Very important. And if there's any questions, well, first of all, I have three questions up here. One, when will the software be released? This is a software-based project with a kind of a research component on it. Intel have us embargo to release this until the project ends, but it will all be done under an Apache license. So this should be out in February of March of 2020, at which point you're free to download, install, and you know, break it to your heart's content. Uh, which would be appreciative. You know, I want to see what works and what doesn't. Can I show you a demo? Of course. You know, come f find me after uh, sometime this evening, later on. I have a quick, simple uh, use case on my laptop. I can show you this. And is there a fluffy tie for everybody in the audience? No, obviously, this guy is just for me today. But we'll be at uh, supercomputing and international supercomputing this year. We have you know, about 1,000 of these. So please come and take them off our hands, because I don't want to take them home. So thank you very much. Do, do the basis vectors have to be words? I asked for two reasons. One, because as you get to a bigger vocabulary, that Hamiltonian path is going to be miserable to compute. Yes. And then any of the latent semantic analysis folks from the 90s to the word embedding folks today are going to say, oh, you could just use one of these to mm -hmm. define your underlying basis features. So you, could you do that? And would it make it scale better? So this is kind of something that we were sitting around over coffee trying to figure out recently. And we think that, yeah, I mean, it, should, it, doesn't, have to be, um, it doesn't have to be that way. We should be able to kind of do any arbitrary uh, way we want. But obviously, there's probably some caveats that we're not thinking of. But I assume it should be, it should be reasonably extendable to such, yes. So you have um, these this circuits which prepare the initial state. So in general, how big are they? 
Yeah, that's the, the, the kind of damning question. Um, they're quite large, yeah. So I mean, to do the encoding for the simple example that I, I had there, you're talking about maybe two to 3,000 gates, uh, or two, two to 3,000 two qubit gates. Um, we're kind of looking at reduction, obviously, you know, we're familiar with plugging this into maybe ZX at some point and seeing if this is a, a good way to kind of reduce this, but yeah, it's, it's quite large now. I mean, there does need to be some optimizations to, to reduce this depth to get it running on a real system. I had some questions, but I think they covered me. Sure. <laughs> exactly the same. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much.